think the biggest challenge the world faces now is the changing role of the United States. Uh, we've lived in a world for over 70 years where the United States has been the dominant global power. Um, and they've carried many burdens uh, in, in, in doing so. Uh, but I think what we're seeing um, is, as a consequence of the changing economic forces in the world that gave rise to Donald Trump as the new president of the United States, I think Americans are looking again at their, ro <coughs> their role in the world. Are they prepared to pay a price to be the provider of global security and stability? And if they're not, then what does that mean for other powers in different regions of the world? Well, the, um, what American power does is provide a basis of stability uh, in the world. And if you don't have stability, you don't have security. Without security, you don't have development. Without development, you don't have human rights. These issues are all linked together uh, and are mutually dependent uh, on one another. But you have to have a basis of, of stability between nations and within nations in order to provide uh, uh, the, the, the human development that we're talking about. I think if the Americans <coughs> withdraw from being the provider of security in Europe, security in Asia, stability in the Middle East, uh, then uh, we're talking about a, a, a rather different world and possibly a more turbulent world uh, even than the one that we're having to deal with uh, at, at present. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, some forces in the world react against American power, uh, but I don't think the uh, withdrawal of the Americans will make it any easier to deal with issues such as regional conflict or terrorism uh, in the years ahead. Uh, it's going to put more responsibility on other powers, medium-sized powers, regional powers, to provide that stability, perhaps with less of an American role. Well, I think one feature of the world that we're dealing with now is more rivalry between great powers, between the United States and China, United States and Russia, uh, Russia and China themselves, uh, China and India, and so on. Um, <clears throat> for much of the last 25 years, we've seen a growing importance for multilateral institutions, whether it's the United Nations or the IMF and the World Bank or regional development banks and the European Union. Um, uh, one of my concerns about the changes in the way America uh, uh, addresses its role in the world is it's paying less attention to these multilateral institutions. So we've got to preserve the power and authority of these institutions um, uh, in the world, and that requires adapting them. Um, clearly, uh, China, now it's a major uh, economic force in the world, needs to have a significantly bigger role in the uh, global economic institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. Um, there's a strong case for reforming the United Nations Security Council uh, to bring on board new powers like India uh, uh, onto, the, onto the council. So um, uh, all these institutions have to adapt and change. Uh, but there's a bigger threat out there, and that is that the international institutions actually become weaker because they don't have the fundamental support of the United States. Uh, or uh, politically, or, uh, and finance will follow the politics. Well, I... I I think this will change from country to uh, vary from country to country. Um, uh, where individuals play an important role is as consumers. Uh, I think it's very interesting looking at India at the moment, how Indian consumers are getting much better organized, much better connected, um, and it's a pathway that Africa will be able to follow in, uh, in years ahead. Um, uh, and so there's a very powerful consumer role that individuals play. I think politically, uh, uh, in democracies, they, they, they play that role through the ballot box, uh, through um, uh, in countries which aren't democratic. There are usually arrangements to ensure there's some consent between the, 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 the government and the people being governed. Um, but I don't think most ordinary people around the world 
uh, spend their days worrying about the IMF and the, um, uh, or even uh, rivalry between China and the United States. I think they have more straightforward things that they, they worry about, their basic security, where they're um, uh, uh, ensuring that they have food on their plates and shelter over their heads and uh, education for their children and jobs uh, for them when they grow up. I think these are the issues which are driving most people in the world. Um, uh, but that requires uh, governments with support from the people delivering services that the people need. But politicians have a responsibility to lead. Now, one of the, uh, the art of politics going back to ancient Rome uh, uh, has been a rivalry between politicians, but the politicians prevail by carrying the support of the people. Uh, so they've got to be on the side of the people if they're going to win. I spent some time working in the United Nations and you, you deal with all three of these issues, security, development and human rights. But it was only after I'd been there for a while I came to understand the interconnection between these three uh, pillars of the world in which we live. Um, uh, at the core of it is security. If people don't have basic security, basic stability in their country, then they can't have a decent life. They can't have an improving life and there's no basis for economic development. And so security is the starting point for development and growth. Um, <clears throat> uh, you can then achieve some development and I think the, the more effective uh, 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 economic growth is in a country, the more people feel a part of that society and they want, they want to see and contribute to the security of that country. Um, and it also creates a framework in which people, individuals, can enjoy human rights. Uh, the, the basic right to uh, make their own decisions, to mix with who they want to mix with, uh, marry who they want to marry, um, uh, and uh, travel freely and invest freely and organize themselves politically uh, freely. Um, and those human rights, I think, uh, tend to uh, grow as a country becomes uh, more developed. And it's also a central element of security, because if people don't have those human rights, why should they accept the basic order within a country? Uh, it's, uh, uh, so development depends on security, human rights depends on development, and ultimately security depends on human rights. And you get these three issues which interlock with one another, um, and if you get them right, then you have a very strong basis for a successful country. You get any one of them wrong, and then the, that, that, security, that country is likely to be uh, in, in difficulty. Now, you can't have 100% security. There are always going to be criminals and violent people. You can't have 100% development. There are always people who miss out. And you can't have 100% human rights either. Uh, you're going to end up with some um, limits in all three areas. But if you can get the great bulk of the people enjoying security, prosperity and their human rights, then you're going to have a successful country. Well, I think modern technology has been a fantastic transformation for the good for in all our lives. Uh, the way in which we communicate with one another. Um, I've just, in the five minutes between my talk and this interview, I've been communicating with my wife and my daughter uh, uh, 2,000 miles away. Um, and you can do it instantly. Uh, 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 it, the way we get information. I've just been cr uh, checking uh, the cricket score of my favourite cricket team uh, who are playing today. Um, uh, so you, you, the, the, your access to information, your ability to uh, build those links uh, between yourself and those things, uh, the other people in your life, uh, life that are important to you, completely transformed. How we do banking, how we access information, everything transformed by technology. But technology is also used by the enemies of society. Uh, technology in itself isn't moral. It's not morally good. Uh, it's neutral. It can be used by bad actors just as the way it can be used by good citizens. And so criminals, uh, uh, people who uh, uh, sexually exploit children, uh, terrorist groups, they, they can all exploit the, the internet as well. And I think the challenge that we face over the next decade or so is how can we 
make sure that the internet is uh, a space which is legally abiding, uh, uh, law abiding, uh, which is uh, safe for ordinary people to operate in. Um, and when crimes are committed online, they can be dealt with. We had this problem in our cities uh, 300 years ago, um, where you had crime, you had violence, you had sexual assaults, uh, you had robbery, um, uh, uh, and we developed police forces, systems of, of, of uh, the courts uh, and the legal structures in order to deal with insecurity in our cities um, and crime in our cities. We need to be able to do that on the internet as well. You cannot afford uh, the internet to be a, a free space where people can conduct evil uh, and the forces of, of law and order, uh, of stability of government, are unable to access those uh, uh, if needed. Now, that doesn't mean there should be constant monitoring of the internet. It doesn't mean that people's privacy should be invaded. Uh, but it does mean that the, uh, if there's good reason and the right authorizations, then I believe that the security forces, the government, should be able to access messages, access information, so that crimes cannot be committed on the internet. I, I think Africa is a, is a, uh, a very promising uh, has a very promising future. Uh, it's going to be the uh, source of a great deal of economic growth in years ahead. I think it's going to be able to exploit technologies uh, in the way that um, uh, it has with mobile telephony, for example, for conducting business and banking and, and trading. Um, I think it's going to be a huge beneficiary from solar power uh, so that you're not dependent on traditional uh, methods of distributing uh, electricity or, or, or energy. So I think Africa is going to be able to leapfrog generations of technology and plug in at a higher level. Um, uh, and uh, I also think Africa is going to become the breadbasket of the world. I think future um, uh, food and um, uh, 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 agricultural products are going to come overwhelmingly from Africa. So the, 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 the promise here is very high. The, the trouble is that uh, Africa has never featured very prominently, partly because it's difficult to do business here, uh, because governments are not well established, um, there is a, an abiding problem of corruption in many parts of Africa, uh, which is a hurdle for, for um, uh, uh, international companies uh, to, to overcome. Uh, I think this is, can be addressed. I think a lot of people are addressing it at the moment. Um, uh, so the potential for Africa is fantastic, um, but it, it's the way in which others view it both Western governments and international um, uh, corporations will in large part depend on the quality of government uh, and that in turn is dependent on dealing with the problem of corruption. Well, Britain's exit from the, from the European Union, in my view, is a mistake. I think it will do Britain harm. Um, and uh, uh, I believe we should do everything we can to minimize that harm. I understand some of the forces that led to Brexit. Uh, I disagree with them, but I understand they exist. And I think their concerns need to be addressed. But if we get this wrong, it will do long-term serious damage to the, uh, uh, the future of the United Kingdom. So it's very important we get it right. I think the election uh, we had uh, on the 8th of June um, actually opens up some more possibilities uh, for, uh, uh, for the negotiation with our European partners. Um, I think it's likely that the consensus that emerged in that election for retaining a close economic and political relationship with our European partners from outside the European Union, I think, is, is, uh, it, it, that, I think that came through in the, in the election. I think there's a possibility for a different sort of negotiation than the one that perhaps Theresa May was envisaging um, uh, having. Uh, uh, and I think that's good. And, and I must say, I think some of the developments in uh, uh, continental Europe, uh, for example, the election of Macron in France, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the likelihood that people like uh, Chancellor Merkel in Germany and uh, Renzi in Italy will come back 
uh, uh, and once again assume leadership, uh, I think uh, that shows promise for the European Union. Certainly, the greatest interest of the UK is to have a successful and thriving European Union with a very close relationship uh, uh, with the European Union. I'm sorry we're not part of the European Union, but if we can't be part of it, we're going to be outside it, we still nonetheless need to be very close economically and in security and defence terms too. Uh, my advice to young people uh, is uh, follow your instincts and your ambitions. Um, uh, I would never have dreamt when I was uh, at university, or even frankly when I was in my 30s, that I would end up as Britain's ambassador to the United Nations and uh, as the chief of MI6. Uh, the, world op the world opens up for those who are confident and who are well educated and well skilled um, uh, and you can achieve much more than you think uh, uh, you could possibly achieve uh, in your younger years. Uh, so I urge people to be positive, to be engaged with the world, uh, engaged with other people. Uh, I think being fundamentally decent and, uh, and friendly with people I think is part of it as well. Uh, but at the core of it is education, skill, uh, being organised, uh, being ambitious, uh, being personable uh, and being reasonable.